Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ484. Therapy quote number 484. Melanie Klein first defined projective identification as children's fantasies of ridding themselves of unwanted feelings by assigning them to someone else. Today, however, most theorists define this construct as the omnipotent fantasy that we can split off an undesirable part of our personality, put it and the affect associated with it into another person, and then recover a modified version of what we put in the other person. So the theory here is that After birth, um, so humans come out of the womb too early. Okay, uh, so there's the biological birth. And then from birth to six months, an extended womb is created. That's called stage of symbiosis or the stage of undifferentiation. So just like in the womb, the baby didn't know where he ended and his mother began. During the extended womb, uh, it's kind of like a uh, a, a womb for the psychological birth to take place at the age of three. So just like the physical womb was needed for the biological birth, uh, this stage of symbiosis is the extended womb that's needed for the psychological birth to follow at the age of three. So during this uh, symbiotic egg period, uh, again, the baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. So if the baby has a need, so there's a psychic fusion there. Uh, the baby uh, doesn't fully, ha doesn't differentiate himself as separate from his mother. They're still fused there. Like in the womb, he didn't understand that he was separate from his mother. Actually, in the womb, we theorize that the baby thinks he's like a little god. He has a need and everything's met. He's fully, <laughs> right? It's just about him. He has a need and it's met. Uh, and similar, in the extended womb, it's kind of similar. He has a need. The mother receives the message and it's met. He kind of thinks in the same way. We call that infantile megalomania, magical thinking and all that, grandiosity and so on. So from birth to six months, during the stage of symbiosis... Oh, hold on a second. I don't know if you can see this. But uh, across the road, he's uh, walking in this direction. There's the fox. And there he goes across. He's behind the bush now. Now he's running to the side. And there he goes. Well, he's just standing there. Can we see him? I don't know. Can you see him? He's sniffing around. <laughs> Okay, there it goes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that's the that's the second appearance by the fox so far. We had one earlier, and this is now the second time. Um, so yeah, we had the blue jay yesterday, and uh, and the fox, and uh, maybe we'll catch the crow later on. I see some of them. <laughs> yeah, I really love having more access to nature. Um, Okay, uh, so, an important concept, uh, theory, theoretical concept, uh, construct, which is that the, baby, the baby's psyche is fused with the mother's psyche. The, so the baby's merged with the mother. The mother knows that she's separate, but from the baby's point of view, the mother's a part of him or an extension of him. That's solipsism, right? Um, so the, the baby thinks it's all about him. So he expresses his, uh, he communicates his need. So in normal development, he, he communicates his need, his feelings to the symbiotic egg. Mother receives it, she's attuned and she meets the need just like the needs were met in the womb. Okay, and if the positive memories outweigh the frustrating memories and it was a secure extended womb, then he can slowly hatch out of the symbiotic egg 
first he differentiates. Now he knows that there's two people, but it's a gradual process from the age of six months to the age of three until the psychological birth. Okay. Now, during those six months, if the frustrating memories outweigh the negative memories, there's a developmental trauma. Okay. The frustrating memory would be that the mother, that the baby communicated his feelings and needs. The mother was misattuned. She didn't get it. Uh, we had a video before the mother using the bottle. And because of that, she wasn't connected to her baby. So she didn't read the signals well. That's why the author said it's better for the mother to use natural feeding uh, so she can be more in tune with the baby. So um, there's a developmental trauma if the baby communicates his needs the mother's misattuned, he's going to try harder, he's going to move around, he's going to provoke, he's going to uh, be a little more active about it, he's going to keep trying and trying, the mother doesn't get it. Okay. And this keeps occurring, reoccurring, uh, to the point where the negative memories outweigh the positive memories. Now we have a developmental trauma. And the defense mechanism of protective identification, of wanting the other to read your mind and meet your needs in, res in response, that defense mechanism is now stuck there. That's a trauma. Now, uh, when there's a trauma, the theory is the psyche repeats the situation in order to master it. But it goes awry after the age of five. So now as an adult, let's say, the person kind of has that pattern. He, ex he expects others to read his mind and meet his needs kind of thing. He still kind of unconsciously using that template of thinking that others are in this psychic world with him uh, well, of course to some degree that's true but I mean he's thinking in terms of uh, getting his needs met like the baby got the needs met he's gonna try to master that trauma so as an adult he's gonna project his attribute his need to someone else make that person, or coax that person to identify with it with the hopes that the other person will respond. Right? Um, if the other person is misattuned, that's going to trigger his memory. He'll try harder. He'll try again. He'll be passive-aggressive. He'll be manipulative. He'll, uh, he'll tell a, a half-truth is the father of many lies. So he'll tell it and coax, frustrate the other person to then talk about things and then the other person is expressing his needs. Uh, the intention is, the positive intention is, he wants the other person to reply to him because back in babyhood time, the mother didn't reply to him appropriately in an, in an attuned way. But this, no one can really do that. It's, it's, um, it's called a secondary delusion because no one can travel back in time to undo what happened. You can't repair that really. Even the most responsive, sensitive, attuned person can't make up for what happened. But the person is caught in the repetition compulsion of keep of using that defensive mechanism to master it, right? so, to get to the point where he no longer needs it, because that's how that's the only way the baby knew to communicate his needs through these nonverbal methods. Someone uh, I noticed. Someone talked about this defense mechanism using Star a Star Trek episode. She uh, modified one episode, changed it a bit, and created what she's calling a spoof or a parody of it. So I'll just read a part of it. Spock says, uh, there's a probe from another ship, which has, uh, another ship has launched a probe, and this probe has configured, has been configured to get past our shield, and has attached itself to the hull of the ship. The probe has interacted with our ship's communications node and is reassigning our electronic parameters uh, to that of the host life form that launched the probe. Okay, so that's a repetition of the baby to the mother. The baby sen sends a probe. She, he's communicating. He's doing something. He wants the mother to receive it. Right. So here in, in the metaphor... This other ship, representing the baby, is sending a probe. Okay, that's the message, the baby's message. 
Now this probe has attached itself to the mother, the enterprise, the ship, the main ship, and is interfa and it's interfacing with the ship's systems. Okay, the captain says, Spock, do something. <laughs> Spock says, most of the ship's data base is infected and the control of the ship is being redirected by the probe. Life support is at risk and the ship's energy seems to be dwindling away. Okay, so the, now the Enterprise is losing uh, energy. So it is draining. It can be draining if another person is, has these strong expectations on you to do something, to say something, and you don't know what, and you're feeling a little tension about it. It is draining your uh, energy a little bit, right? And uh, the ship's computer says life support warning, ship's oxygen 72% decreasing. The captain says, Spock, Spock, uh, do something. <laughs> Spock says, my analysis confirms a power surge, okay? We can reroute the ship's command and reinitiate the contaminated database to contain the projected energy radiating from the probe. It seems, Captain, that the probe is receiving instructions from the host life form. So Spock is sort of describing in metaphor of what the mother is feeling. That, that the baby's message, the probe from the ship, has gotten into the mother's mind, so to speak, and it's uh, interacting and it's tiring for the... So the mother, Spock speaking on the voice of the mother, is saying what, what the mother can do, what the sh mother ship can do, is reroute the ship's command so understand the message, think, mentalize it, conceptualize it. And uh, now with this stressful situation, let's contain, let's hold, let's understand the message, let's hold it. Okay, Let, let's hold it. And the, the captain says, okay, hold it, do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. And then... Sulu says, uh, Sir, the life force shows signs of distress. Should we follow procedures as outlined in the Prime Directive? The captain says, You're right. Spock, can you send the probe back to the host life form with a message of goodwill from the Starfleet? Okay, so he's saying, Now, okay, the mother for the baby, now the ship, the large ship for the baby, for the small ship, it's going to send back that probe, that message they received that was stressful. They modified it, they contained it, they understood it. They're going to return it with a message of goodwill. That's what the mother does to the baby. The mother is going to meet the needs. The baby says he's, he needs this. The mother responds with a message of goodwill. So now the enterprise is going to send a message of goodwill to this distressed other ship out there. Okay. Uh, Spock says, yes. Now that we have contaminated, uh, contained the probe, we are able to detoxify and metabolize the opposing forces within the probe. We can modify the probe's circuits and offer something more attractive to the life force. And the captain says, okay, do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, so Spock is explaining Yes, we, as the main ship, can detoxify and metabolize the forces uh, within that probe. And we can modify this probe okay, uh, and offer it something more attractive. That's the message of goodwill. So, confirming that. And, um, and then the, this other ship, the smaller ship, received the new probe, received the nice message, and was happy and they they went their merry way that kind of thing so that little uh dynamic that little process um, um is, is what the, the baby is trying to do right but when there's a developmental trauma the person is still doing it to some degree okay uh 
Now remember, all immature infantile defense mechanisms like projective identification and splitting and externalization, magical thinking and mind re expecting one to read your mind and uh, narcissism and uh, reaction formation and acting out to preserve this. All of these infantile immature defense mechanisms are meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. But when there's a developmental trauma, they keep replaying. They keep the person is still using them. The positive, the positive intention is that they want to get it right. They want to get it to succeed, but it goes awry because no one as an adult can compensate for what the mother didn't do for the baby. It doesn't. You can't travel back in time to undo those memories. All right. So we act out and repeat, or we. Uh, put words and talk about it and mourn. So that's what the therapy process is all about, to talk about it um, and, uh, and to, to heal the splits. And, with the, and when we heal the splits, uh, projective identification is no, no longer needed. You know, you can sometimes see this. We had a video mentioned before about people with a symbiotic character disorder. Oh, hold on a sec. We got a visitor here. There's the crow. You see, I had uh, some peanuts on the table before, but uh, they're all gone now. So I guess he just came to check out the table to see if there were any more peanuts. <laughs> or maybe he's wondering, where are the peanuts? What happened? Are there any more? Or maybe he... Maybe he's using projective identification. Maybe he wants to communicate to me and tell me, hey, I, I want those peanuts. Read my mind, where are the peanuts? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll just uh, leave him alone. Maybe he'll do a little jump or something. There he goes. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, today I discovered that the crows, uh, like peanuts or <laughs> in a, uh, I, I tried to do this video, uh, before and the crows took all the peanuts. And then uh, I had to redo the video, so <laughs> the peanuts are gone. <laughs> but uh, they could usually take one or two, and then they, they would fly off. And the Blue Jays, they like the peanuts, too. Um, okay, so... Um, yeah, the, the person with the symbiotic character disorder, so that's a developmental trauma they're continuously using projective identification with people. They're always coaxing others and doing little things and being manipulative and being very passive aggressive and a lot of innuendo equ equivocation and a lot of um, subtle little things. They're trying, they want others to express their repressed feelings. They want others to say what they don't, what they're afraid to say. They want others to take on some role that, that would express what they're repressing and, or denying uh, and they can be kind of demanding about that um, so that's that's a sign of the developmental uh, uh, developmental uh, trauma during the before the age of three if projective identification is still being used and I think the symbiotic character disorder relies heavily on protective identification um, so, uh, in an earlier video, we mentioned uh, a, f a few of the motivations for it. the primary motivation. Let's say there's, let's say there are two friends. Uh, the first friend unknowingly is projecting something onto his friend. Uh, the other, that friend uh, feels it, responds, 
and then receives it as a communication and then replies. That, that other person says, hey, I'm starting to feel such and such. Are you maybe feeling such and such? And the projector says, now that you mention it, yes, I am. So there's a kind of very benign little thing happening. The person doesn't know he's feeling maybe a little anxious. Suddenly his friend is feeling anxious. The friend notices it and talks about it. Now, the, now they can deal with it. Sometimes the projector, uh, another, another quote was about misery loves company. Sometimes the projector is a little sad. He coaxes the other person to feel sad. Now he feels the, the benefit of the company, of having a companion there. So he feels better that way. Um, another version of it was to control the ability to maintain the deep ambivalence, the splitting defense mechanism. Right? So sometimes a person will project something onto another person, coax the other person to demonstrate it, so that the projector can convince himself that since it's outside, it's not within, thereby preserving the denial. So he's maintaining the, the deep ambivalence because he don't want, doesn't want to face the deep ambivalence. The deep ambivalence is the memories of the mother being sometimes loving and sometimes being rejecting and, and not being able to bring the two together to form a whole representation of her because the rejecting memories outweigh the frustrating memories. So that's what causes the splitting. All right. Uh, in, in, in a secure attachment style, the positive memories outweigh the frustrating memories so that a whole representation is created. But when it's the other way around, then the splitting is there and there's that deep ambivalence. Right? And, when the, and then again, with the, when the splitting is there, that's linked to projective identification. If the person has uh, identified with the, reje with the rejecting image of the, of, um, the mother, okay, then he projects his wounded inner child onto others and does to them what was done to communicate what was done to him. Right? That's a negative magic gesture. Or he projects the rejecting image onto a non-threatening substitute other and now wants to coax that other that innocent other person to respond uh, in the way he wanted, in the way him as a baby wanted his mother to respond. But no one could do that. So it's repetition compulsion gone awry. Right. You know, I, there's even a, a play or a novel from the 60s that talked about this. Uh, the guy had a very, uh, a Jocasta mother. The mother was very, uh, the story, the basic story was the mother exploited the child to meet her needs. That person grew up and then exploited others. Right. So, uh, so the mother exploited the child. The child then identified with the aggressor. He projects his wounded inner child onto others and does to others what his mother did to him. That's a negative magic gesture. And he had all these, in the novel, he had all these philosophies, you know. He's quoting, he's parroting his mother. Everything his mother's, everything he said is what his mother said to him as a child. He doesn't know it, you see. So there's a, a kind of splitting, projective identification, acting out. So he's caught in the repetition compulsion of having a Jocasta mother, of the insecure attachment style. And the therapist said he, he didn't want to, the journey for him would be to, to talk, not repeat, act out, repeat, repeat, Sisyphus, Sisyphus, no, no. You, you pause and you start to talk, right? And you symbolize, you metabolize, and so on. Because no other person can undo that. And in that novel, I remember, uh, he did meet a person who was kind and caring. Even that wonderful person couldn't do it. He even looked down that person because he accused her of accepting the premise of his inner shame and all that. So you see how it is. <laughs> it's rapid. Repeating the childhood trauma all your life, it's, it's an unlived life because it can never be mastered. No one can travel back in time to a time machine. The healing journey is to, um, is to integrate the split off parts, to amalgamate the two parts of the self, to face that deep ambivalence. That's the work of mourning, the working through process. So we talk, we, we uh, bring up the memories, the splits come together, we feel safe, we cry and, and so on. So the main idea here is that projective identification is an immature defense mechanism 
It's meant to be existential hearsay along with all the other immature defense mechanisms by the age of three, but if there's a developmental trauma, they're still being used. All right. It's just that awareness, you know, that the pressure of identification is an immature infantile defense mechanism. It stems from the baby expecting his mother to read his mind and the mother responds, and that's good, that's how it's supposed to be, and then at the, all right, for the first six months, and then gradually that the baby is weaned off of that, so to speak, until the age of three, and then he achieves a, a connection to himself. Robert Bly says, when there's an insecure attachment style, the goal is for the person to get the key out from under a mother's pillow, to separate your image of yourself from the image of the mother. Because otherwise, you're, if it's blurred and fused, you don't know who you are. But if you separate out, then the plumb line can come to yourself. You cathect to yourself. You decathect to the rejecting image of the mother, the psychic umbilical cord. You decathect that from the rejecting image of the mother. Okay, And then the life force can cathect to the self. That's the plumb line to the self. All right. Oh, hold on. I've got a little visitor here. Ah, the blue jay. <laughs> I don't know if you, I don't know if, I don't know if it showed, but the Blue Jay made a, a quick half a second appearance. I don't think it showed, but. <laughs> I need to put some more peanuts out. It goes quickly. <laughs> yeah, they, they really love the peanuts. My goodness, they, they, both the Blue Jays and the Crows, they, they really love the peanuts. <laughs> Okay, so this has been a little bit more on protective identification, which has been a, a thread throughout this series. Earlier in the in this series, we had about a dozen quotes on protective identification. Uh, this quote adds to our collection and, and our growing understanding of it. Um, all right, so with that, I'll, I'll leave it here for today. So thank you very much. This has been TQ484. More to follow. Bye for now.